Inspiring others is not an end, but a byproduct of exceptional individuals' determination, persistence, and passion to explore opportunities, find new avenues, and unlock possibilities from just a simple thought. Sohar International thrives on the principles that make winning possible and recognizes individuals who echo the same mindset. The 12th edition of Viewpoints, Sohar International Chairman's Forum. We want this platform to really be a bridge between the aspiring youth of this country and the global leaders like our guest tonight. A unique platform that brings global visionaries and pioneering ideas to make an impact in Oman. In its seventh virtual session, hosts a conversation with internationally acclaimed journalist, Mr. George Delama, president of Eisenhower Fellowships, is a shining example of an individual who has trained thousands of highly motivated individuals from a simple thought of creating a global network of future leaders. Recipient of the prestigious Pulitzer Prize, Mr. George Delama serves as the perfect example of how to make simple ideas make a difference and be called the coin of the realm. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome uh, to this session of uh, Viewpoints. As you all know, Viewpoints Sahar International Chairman Forum endeavors to enrich individuals, especially the youth, by bringing in inspirational global leaders to share their experience and ideas. Today, topics is the coin of the real, defines the spectrum of human emotions, and perseverance that can be channelized with simple thoughts to open a world of possibilities. These simple thoughts can turn into experiences that enable you to win in life's journey as the people of this country carry forward its rich historical culture, social and economic legacy. This session will encourage them to move beyond barriers, break stereotypes and yet stay relevant in today's fast changing world. Remember everything we see around us began as a thought or as an idea in the mind of a single person before it was translated into reality. This pragmatic thinking and more life lessons will be highlighted today by our acclaimed guest speaker, George Dilemma, the president of the Eisenhower Fellowship. George is a highly skilled versatile international civil servant, and deep knowledge of journalism, politics, and international affairs. And above all, he's a friend. As an editor, George led Chicago Tribune team to a number of awards, including two Pulitzer Prizes. He's also a proud member of the advisory board of the Neiman Foundation for Journalism at Harvard University. He became 10th president of the Eisenhower Fellowship in August 2014. Before I invite George Dilemma, I would request our guests to join today's session by typing their questions in the designated Q&A box displayed on the screens, preferably with their name and designation. We will try to address as many questions as time permits during the latter half of today's virtual session. So without further delay, I'd like to welcome our guest, uh, George, to Viewpoints. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, I'd like to um, thank our distinguished trustee, Mohammed al for, uh, thank you for your kind introduction and for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, Oman is one of my favorite countries in the Gulf region. It's a place where I have uh, some dear personal friends. I'm, as you mentioned, the 10th president of Eisenhower Fellowships, and uh, my background is not at all like that of my predecessors. Eight of the nine were US diplomats. My immediate predecessor was ambassador to Malaysia and assistant secretary of state for nonproliferation. The ninth was a university president. So I thought I would start out by telling a story I've never even told you, Mohammed, about how I came to be here. Absolutely, let, let us know. 
Okay, well, when an executive search firm called to tell me that the president of Eisenhower Fellowships was retiring and to inquire about my interest in the position, I told them, I don't think I'm your guy. I'm the son of immigrants. My father never finished high school. And I happily angered many people from both political parties my entire adult life as a journalist. So I told uh, these headhunters, I probably wasn't their ideal candidate. And they said, no, they wanna talk to you. So General Colin Powell, our former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and former US Secretary of State, he was the chairman of Eisenhower Fellowships then. He's a dear friend of uh, Mohammed's. General Powell helped persuade me to come. I deeply admire General Powell ever since I covered him back in my 20s when he was the National Security Advisor to President Reagan. As I reminded him, I was young, I was in my 20s, but he was my fourth National Security Advisor to the President uh, when I was a White House correspondent for the Chicago Tribune. The General's background is from Jamaica. My people are from Cuba, neighbors in the Caribbean. He wanted to give a new face to Eisenhower Fellowships, I believe. And my immigrant background is vital to my formation. It really gave me my life. And uh, so I wanna tell you a little story. Again, I've never even shared with Mohammed. Uh, I grew up in a very gritty urban neighborhood in Chicago called Uptown, where in my sixth grade class of the boys, two of us went to university and about eight of us went to the joint, went to prison. My grandfather came from Cuba to live with us when I was five years old. He told me the story of his father, my great-grandfather, Domingo de Lama. He had been a sergeant in the Spanish army, sent to Cuba in 1898 to fight the Americans in the Cuban War of Independence, which is known in the US as the Spanish-American War. Domingo de Lama survived. I wound up meeting him before he passed away. He survived the war. He went back to Spain. He married his village sweetheart. And when my grandfather was five years old, he sailed off to Cuba. He had sympathized with the Cuban cause and told everyone that he had found a tropical paradise. My great-grandfather went on to have eight children. The oldest was my grandfather. The youngest was his little brother, Ricardo de Lama, but he was known to everyone in the family as Ricky, even back in Cuba. Ricky emigrated from Havana to New York City in the 1930s, where like Mohammed, he was a dashing pilot. Only Ricardo de Lama was a stunt pilot. He specialized in acrobatic air shows. He flew women on the wings of his biplane around the Empire State Building. I've seen photographs uh, after hearing the stories. When World War II broke out, he tried to join the new US Army Air Corps, the forerunner to the United States Air Force, but he was turned down. He was told he was too old, but that he could fly gliders. He said, no, you can fly gliders because he foresaw that the glider pilot casualty rate in World War II would be close to 85%, which it was. So he joined the infantry instead. He was a soldier in the United States Fifth Army that fought its way up the Italian boot against the German Wehrmacht. He landed in Italy in the Anzio invasion in early 1944. He was part of the allied force that liberated Rome without a shot in June of that year. Then he fought his way up through Umbria and Tuscany where the Germans were waiting for them. On November 23rd, 1944, Thanksgiving day that year, just a few months before the end of the war, in a little town called Liveriano, high in the Apennine Mountains in Northern Tuscany, my great uncle Ricardo was shot dead in his foxhole by a German sniper. His story captured my imagination as a boy. This guy from Havana, Cuba, he died so far from home, part of an epic history. Here you had my great grandfather had fought against the US Army in the war that ended Spanish colonialism in the New World and in Asia. Then less than 50 years later, his youngest son is killed in action serving in the US Army in the great global war that reordered the world. To me, that was always the American century. And it made me proud as a son of immigrants that my family helped shape it and that we could share in his great promise. I always loved to read, so this made me devour history books from the time I was a little boy. It made me realize there's a great big world out there and it made me determine to take a great big bite out of it one day. Ricardo de Lama's story inspired me and set me on the path to become a journalist someday and see the world. So I did. Along the way, I've been deeply and repeatedly blessed. I have also seen war up close myself and survived. Over the years, I covered nine different armed conflicts as a correspondent for the Chicago Tribune, including all the wars in Central America in the 1980s, then later the drug wars against Pablo Escobar and the Medellin cartel in Colombia, the guerrilla war against Shining Path and another rebel group called Tupac Amaru in Peru, the Falkland Islands War in Argentina, 
and the first Gulf War against Iraq and Saddam Hussein in 1991 and its aftermath. I learned firsthand the unimaginably utter destruction and gruesome senselessness of armed conflict. Ultimately, perhaps the greatest irony of all this is that my great uncle Ricardo's commanding officer in World War II, the supreme commander of all allied troops in Europe fighting the Nazi war machine was General Dwight David Eisenhower. Now I'm privileged to lead this prestigious global organization that bears his name. The greatest American military leader of the 20th century, Eisenhower wrote that he was a soldier who had seen too much of war. Our organization, where our friend Mohammed Alardi is a dedicated trustee, our organization is dedicated to General Eisenhower's vision that direct dialogue between men and women of goodwill can bring about understanding that allows confrontation to give way to cooperation. If he could be with us today, I wonder what my great uncle Ricardo would say about where our family wound up, because some things you just can't make up. And all of that brings me here to be with you and my friend Mohammed today. George, thank you. That's uh, an amazing, interest, inspiring and emotional uh, story. Uh, I guess I want to ask you, what ideas would you like to share then? from all this experience so far. Well, thank you, Mohammed. I'd like to, before we open it up to questions and a conversation, let me share with you three simple but profound ideas that have helped guide me along the way. The first one, for all you young people out there, it goes against conventional wisdom in your generation, probably against everything you have ever heard. The first one is marry your passion with your purpose. People say, follow your heart, but don't do that. Don't just follow your heart. Maybe that's all right in love and romance, but in career choices, in business, in how you operate in the world, you'll probably make horrible mistakes. And in all likelihood, you'll get your heart crushed that way. So align your heart and your head, marry your passion with your purpose. In my career, in journalism, in international development, in online education, and now in the nonprofit world, I've always been attracted to the kind of work where if you do well, you'll do some good. At Eisenhower Fellowships, that is the very mission our reason to exist, to do some good and make this a better world. Eisenhower Fellowships exist to inspire mid-career leaders around the world to challenge themselves, to envision how they can affect positive change, to engage others beyond their existing networks, and to collaborate with other like-minded leaders across national borders and cultures to better the world around them. In Spanish, we have a saying, quiero poner mi granito de arena. I want to put in place my little grain of sand to help build something better that's not there now. Knowing that we all ride the tides of the sea and that eventually what we build will likely be washed away by the waves. But within our lifetimes, that is what we can do. Put something in place, our little grain of sand to build something better. So that's what I've always aspired to do. Marry your passion with your purpose. It is important, yes, to love what you do because you have to do it every day. And if you love what you do, you will inevitably do it better than if you don't. But that's not enough. You need to channel it in a direction that will help you fulfill your God-given potential and maximize your impact during the brief, brief time we all have on this earth. So that takes me to the second thought. How do you do that? And this one, uh, what I have learned is plan your work and work your plan. But it's not the plan that's important. It's the planning. General Eisenhower was known for being an outspoken advocate of an old military truism. Plans are worthless, but planning is indispensable. In combat, no plan survives the first contact with the enemy. Planning requires setting objectives and identifying the main issues involved and the potential obstacles you might face in achieving them. But the details of any particular plan designed far in advance are often outdated and overtaken by events as conditions change. To be relevant, the planning process demands a thorough exploration of all possible options and contingencies. The knowledge gained during this kind of planning is crucial to being able to adapt and select a new appropriate course of action as events unfold. A great recent example of this we've all lived through is the COVID pandemic. At Eisenhower Fellowship, we had our strategic objectives in place and our plans set for our fellowship programs last year. We had two programs in the works that brought international fellows to the United States and two that sent ascendant American leaders overseas. But then COVID hit and it turned the world upside down for everyone. So our plan for our programs, along with the budgets and spending and revenue targets that supported it, all of that was suddenly useless. But because we had done the hard work of planning, 
we understood what new options were required to change course and adapt to our new realities. We had to find new tools and think in new ways. So we did. Against all odds, despite the pandemic shutting down the US and much of the world for much of the year, we we're able to pursue our objectives. We implemented a historic all virtual fellowship program for women leaders around the world. And we were able to send young Americans overseas in our inaugural Eisenhower Global Scholars Program, which sends outstanding American college graduates abroad for a year of postgraduate studies leading to a master's degree at the University of Oxford in the UK and at IE University in Madrid. All because we had done the planning. We knew what we needed to do and rapidly changing circumstances blew up our original plan. So plan your work and work your plan, but it's not the plan that's important, it's the planning. That brings me to my third and final thought, the title I gave this little talk, The Coin of the Realm. This is perhaps the single most important thought I want to leave with you. There is just one simple but profound word that opens the door to all of life's possibilities, trust. George Shultz, the late US Secretary of State who lived and saw and helped shape the entire last century of human existence, he poignantly reminded us of the importance of this single solitary word in an op-ed he wrote in the Washington Post to mark his 100th birthday, right before he died. There is one lesson I learned early and then relearned over and over, he wrote. Trust is the coin of the realm. When trust was in the room, whatever room that was, the family room, the school room, the locker room, the office room, the government room, or the military room, good things happened. When trust was not in the room, good things did not happen. The rest is details. Eisenhower Fellows know this innately. At its core, Eisenhower Fellowships is about building relationships of trust. We bring together women and men of goodwill to enhance understanding through dialogue, creating the essential bonds of trust that promote collaboration with impact to advance our mission of creating a world more peaceful, prosperous, and just. That was President Eisenhower's vision. Every day in every corner of the planet, Eisenhower fellows work together to make it a reality. They confront COVID, treat the ailing, serve on the front lines of our first responders. They enact policies that assist the most vulnerable, educate our children, illuminate our lives, and ignite our imagination with art that inspires us to envision a better world. Over the last two years, throughout the pandemic, our fellows have employed all their creativity, ingenuity, and resourcefulness to meet the moment in new ways. At Eisenhower Fellowships, we use the COVID crisis to rethink and reimagine our programs and operations so we can advance our mission, mission despite the pandemic and then move forward in a new post-COVID world. Let me close by giving you just two examples. Next spring, we're planning an innovative regional fellowship program fo focused exclusively on leaders from diverse fields in Sub-Saharan Africa who combat climate change in all its many dimensions. We focused on Africa because climate change is severely adversely affecting the social order across the continent. Another innovative program we're planning is a women's leadership program focused exclusively on Muslim women leaders from all fields, from all around the world. We are currently trying to secure funding for this Muslim women's leadership program, which would be our fourth annual fellowship program dedicated exclusively to women's leadership in the last 12 years. So this last year has taught us many lessons. In a world where nothing will ever be the same, neither will our fellowship programs. Long after the pandemic passes, all our future programs will be hybrid, combining virtual engagement before each fellowship with in-person meetings and travels across the US and other lands. Looking ahead to 2022, we've prepared several alternative planning scenarios that we'll be sharing with Mohammed and our other trustees at an upcoming board meeting next month. When and how we can start these programs largely depends on factors beyond our control, ranging from the availability of travel visas and COVID vaccines around the world to potential travel restrictions and quarantine requirements that may persist for many months more. Like everyone else, we have no choice but to embrace the ambiguity and uncertainty that defines our world today. But move forward, we will. Each day I grow more convinced that in these turbulent times, the work and mission of Eisenhower Fellowships to build bridges across borders and cultures by connecting leaders and relationships of trust to drive positive impact, this mission has never been more relevant or vital. In the process, we like to think that EF, as we call our organization, projects the best face of the United States to the world. The familiar, open, welcoming face that countless millions have long admired for the way Americans historically have offered outstretched arms to other nations to make common cause in confronting common challenges. In this work, I am a lucky man indeed to have such generous and dedicated colleagues as your chairman, our distinguished trustee, 
my friend, Mohammed al -Ardi. I'm honored and deeply grateful for his wonderful support and his always thoughtful guidance. Thank you, Mohammed, for having me join you in your chairman's forum today. I think I'll leave it there and open it up to sure. your questions and a conversation. George, thank you. That's really fantastic. I guess, uh, uh, you know, when you, uh, when you describe uh, the purpose and the vision of the Eisenhower Fellowship, uh, many will be really interested to know the mechanics of it. I mean, how does it work? How would an, uh, an, an Omani uh, should aspire to this? And what happens? So he gets there and uh, how does he live that experience? Uh, what uh, would he hope to get out of it? And how do you help him? Okay. Well, first of all, this is a very distinguished organization with that's been around for 68 years. I've only been here for the last seven. Eisenhower Fellowships was founded as a birthday present to President Eisenhower, his first year in the White House in 1953, by four prominent Philadelphia uh, businessmen, friends of his, which is why the organization is based in Philadelphia. Um, over the years, there have been, uh, the, the organization was built, the mission I mentioned is the same as it was then, to enhance international understanding through dialogue to create a world more peaceful, prosperous, and just. That's a very broad umbrella under which many things fit. Eisenhower Fellows are uh, mid-career ascendant leaders between ages roughly 32 to 45 from all fields, government, business, civil society, science, education, technology, healthcare, the arts. We even take journalists. Uh, there have been more than 2,400 Eisenhower Fellows from the beginning of the program. And um, of whom we believe about 1,900 are still alive. Of those, uh, more than 1,600 we consider uh, are active members of our global network because we're in contact with them. Traditionally, we have two programs a year that send anywhere from 20 to 25 uh, international fellows. We've operated in 115 countries over the years. Right now, we're active in about 60. And we bring two programs of international fellows to the United States each year, generally in the spring and in the fall. One, a global program from all over the world. Another one, a program targeted to a specific region, geography, or sector. So in this Africa program, we're doing something new. We're combining both things. It's targeted just on Sub-Saharan Africa, but this, the, the sector is fighting, clim com sorry, fighting climate change. In the past, women's leadership is a particular tailored program to that sector. We've had a couple of innovation programs of innovators. So these are two programs a year. Uh, they are so fellows are selected by nominating committees, usually comprised of fellows from past years and from other prominent citizens in more, as I mentioned, about 60 countries around the world. Fellows can also apply, candidates can also apply directly to us in Philadelphia where we will do a, a first vetting and then send the promising candidates to the nominating committees in their countries. Besides the international fellows that come to the United States, and I'll explain the program later, we have a smaller but growing part of our programs. It's American fellows, USA program, we call it, to send ascendant American leaders, mid-career leaders with the same profiles uh, overseas, because and we're trying to grow that program because we believe it is as important or more now for Americans to understand your nations around the world as it is for you to understand us. So if you're selected as an Eisenhower Fellow, first thing, you have a commitment to uh, remain engaged with the organization for the rest of your life to advance the mission. Second, we have added in the last few years, there's another requirement that you have to be able to design and implement a concrete program to generate a positive social impact back in your country when you go back home. And we will track it and measure it with measurable outcomes. And we will track it and help you connect with other fellows and other people who might help you be able to put this in place. But that concrete impact is a requirement. And then we've added to that because this has always been very important to me personally. And I, as it, I know it is to you, Mohammed that uh, Eisenhower Fellows have to commit to mentoring younger leaders behind them, because that in itself is a way to extend and maximize the impact of our programs. When you're selected as an Eisenhower Fellow, you are brought to the United States 
Generally speaking, now it's in flux because of COVID, but generally speaking, the programs have been uh, six and a half weeks and you travel to eight, you start in Philadelphia to meet everybody else in your cohort. And then everyone is scattered to the winds. If there are 25 fellows in a program, most will go to probably Washington or a lot of like to go to Harvard, to, uh, to Boston to visit Harvard or MIT. And some go to, many of them go to Silicon Valley. But in the meantime, they go all over the place. If you're an urban planner, for instance, we will introduce you, we will set you up uh, with meetings with the top urban planners, architects, et cetera, in your field. And you can go to six, eight, 10 American cities and our fellows meet anywhere from 60 to 80. Some have met more than a hundred leaders in their fields uh, during the fellowship. Uh, before then they come back and do a closing seminar here in Philadelphia. Similarly, our American fellows we send overseas, uh, those are for a little bit shorter period. It was uh, four to five, four and a half to five weeks and they can go to one or two countries, but they meet with the top people in the field. And the thinking is, first, it'll expand your networks. It will challenge you to grow, but also it will help you apply what you learned to make a positive impact in your societies when you return back home. Uh, so now during COVID, some of these things are in flux, and we just did our first, as I mentioned, all virtual program last year, Women's Leadership. This year, the global program, we did the first part virtually in the spring, and next week, uh, most, if not all, of the global fellows uh, from around the world will be coming to Philadelphia to complete the last two and a half weeks of their program here in person. So, uh, Mohammed, you will get to meet them at our board meeting next month. Uh, I look forward to that, uh, George. Uh, George, we're starting to have uh, a lot of really good questions from the public, so I will uh, just move for some of them. Uh, this one is from uh, Nasser al Husri, and he says, what are the measures of success of the program? Well, first of all, uh, the, the quality of the fellows in the selection process that is, uh, that is essential to everything that comes afterwards. So we take a lot of care with that to uh, identify and vet the best candidates. The, the programs themselves, when we put together a cohort of fellows, we really, Eisenhower Fellowships uh, right now, we very much value the diversity of the fellows. If you look around the world right now, there's increasing multidisciplinary approach to problem solving and public-private partnerships are driving innovation everywhere. So that kind of diversity is found within our programs and it's something we value very deeply. And ultimately, um, if you're gonna be engaged with us for the rest of your life, one of the things we really value and try to build is stickiness. Engagement is a very important word here. And so we have this opening seminar to put the fellows together to make sure that they get off to a good start and that they will become this cohort, they will know each other for the rest of their lives. I have met fellows here from the 1950s who are still close to other fellows from their class back then. And um, to the extent that they stay committed with each other, to the organization, and then this new requirement just in the last few years that they do really uh, compelling projects that have a measurable impact in bettering society in their homes. Those are the markers we look at to, uh, to, to be able to evaluate the success of our programs. Uh, George, another question is, uh, can you give us an example, and this is from Ahmed al Asfour, uh, of uh, a project that you thought uh, one of the fellows have made a great impact in, uh, on himself or his community? Sure, I'll just give you one very recent one. Uh, we have a fellow, Magali Blas from Peru. Uh, she, is, uh, she is an outstanding uh, medical doctor and scientist. She started a program in Peru in the Amazon basis called in Spanish, Mamas del Rio, Mothers of the River. And it was to provide um, it was to provide medical care for expectant mothers and new mothers in uh, maternity care for women who had no access or very little access to healthcare services in the Amazon region in the jungle, which is a very impoverished part of Peru where it borders with Colombia and, and Brazil. 
She came on her fellowship just two years ago to Eisenhower Fellowship to Philadelphia and went across the United States, met top people in her field. We introduced her to experts at the Inter-American Development Bank, which is kind of the regional World Bank uh, equivalent for Latin America in Washington. The experts there love their program. Uh, the IDB gives um, $14 billion a year in grants and loans and assistance for, to aid sustainable development in Latin America. They loved her program. So they got together with her and they brought the IDB brought together, it's owned by 48 nations around the world. Um, they brought together the health ministers of Peru and Colombia. Now, these are two bordering countries that are have not been very friendly over the years, and they've even had armed clashes along their border. But they share an Amazon River basin border. They brought together the two health ministers with our fellow Magali, and the two countries signed an accord to bring her program, this is just last year, to both sides of the river uh, on, in both countries to serve the young uh, mothers and mothers-to-be in Colombia and Peru who did not have access to health care. Uh, that's just one example. We have many. Brilliant. Uh, an interesting question uh, uh, from Leila Hassan. It says, you did not plan to be in this role, uh, but you are now leading this amazing organization. So you ended here without much planning. And this role wasn't your passion and not a purpose that you pursued. So what is the lesson from your story? Um, you know, plans are what men and women make and that God laughs at uh, when things change. So, but I did, I did have one advantage. You had mentioned I'm on the board, uh, the advisory board at the Neiman Foundation for Journalism at Harvard. I was a Neiman fellow at Harvard uh, years ago. I've been on the board for about 13 years. And that fellowship program has an ethos very similar to ours. You, they expect, it has a simple but profound mission to elevate the standards of journalism. It has, it's half Americans and half international. It's about 25 in a program, kind of like us, only they're there for a whole year at Harvard. And, uh, and fellows are expected to, um, they're expected to remain committed to with the organization to advance its mission for the rest of their lives. So I have stayed engaged for the, since I was a fellow years ago. I've uh, spoken at their conferences, been serving on their board. A couple of years ago, the, the provost of Harvard University asked me to lead a panel that did a confidential program impact evaluation of the program. I tried to get out of it, but he wouldn't take no. So I did it with, a, with love. And um, so I understood the ethos. Fellowship uh, in English, really, it has two meanings. One is a period of study, like a scholarship. The other is it invokes a community. And so that ethos I understood, and that's what made this very attractive. And as I said before, I didn't plan on this specific thing, uh, this specific role, but what appealed to me about it was, uh, again, like journalism, like everything I've done, I've always been attracted to the kind of work that's bigger than yourself, that the kind of work where if you do well, you do some good. And that's our mission here. And then the irony is, and this is how life works, and Mohammed, you know this, you have worn many hats uh, in your very distinguished career. I needed to do, I think, everything I've done without planning the path, but I needed to do everything I've done to be able to get my arms around this and do this as well as, uh, as I possibly can. And so life has a way of connecting the dots that way that you might not be aware of while you're going through each experience. Right. Right. It's amazing what you, you stumble in life when you do the right things. Well, my uncle always said it's an old line, but it, I reminded of it all the time. Luck is when preparation meets opportunity because many people have an opportunity, but if you're not prepared, uh, it's wasted often because you can't take advantage of it. So, yeah. Uh, another question from uh, Darwish al Belushi saying, uh, what would be your uh, uh, advice on uh, dealing with a crisis uh, and avoiding getting uh, a negative outcome? 
Well, that's a big one. We could have a long conversation about that. It depends on what kind of crisis, I guess. But first of all, I think a couple of things. One, since I was a young correspondent, for instance, I mentioned in, in conflict zones, whatever was going on crazy around you, I found it always helped to focus on what are you there for? What is your purpose? And, and, and focus on that. And that always helped me get through it and my colleagues who I respected deeply to get through things. So a crisis, um, what is it? Is the crisis surrounding you? Is the crisis a direct obstacle in front of you and in front of your objective? Um, if so, one thing I've learned is that, uh, cause I had great teachers who are really good at this in every setback, somewhere in there is an amazing opportunity. Um, President Reagan used to tell a joke that over and over, but there was a point to it. He said when he was a little boy, he was the kind of kid that under his Christmas tree, if uh, he, that he woke up one day and he made a joke that under the tree was a lot of horse manure. And he said, but I was the kind of kid who knew there was a pony in there somewhere. And, uh, and I think there's a serious point to that in every in every setback, there is an opportunity, sometimes an amazing opportunity to do things you wouldn't have done before. So those two things, keep your mind on your purpose and try to focus, try to uh, block out what's extemporaneous, what's, what's extraneous, that's not, that's not core to what you need to accomplish and look for where is the hidden opportunity in a crisis. And hopefully, you know, what happens is over time and you had enough experiences in different, um, in different kinds of situations where you've had ups and downs and setbacks, after a while you realize, uh, hey, I can do this because you've done it before. It might not be the same situation, but it might be something similar. And then the last thing, and it goes back to my last point of trust. The older I've gotten, Mohammed, the more I really deeply value something else. It's very simple, but profound. People who very simply just do what they say they're gonna do. And so do what you say you're going to do. If you can't do it or you don't think you can do it, be honest and say, I really don't know if I can do that. I'm not sure. But if you say you're going to do something, do it, because that is how you actually build trust. And trust is really what's necessary more than ever in a time of crisis. Fantastic. Uh, George, this is uh, a question and maybe slightly out uh, outside uh, this discussion, but I think it's relevant. It's about climate change. And from where you sit, uh, what opportunities you think we can capture of global challenges such as climate change? I'm sorry, what, is, what opportunities do I see? Yeah, that, that we can uh, benefit from or capture of global challenges such as climate change. Well, I think that's an example of what I just talked about. It's a huge monumental challenge around the world. We can see it with the weather phenomena we're having in the United States where the storms are more intense, the, the, the highs temperatures are higher. Uh, even uh, climate change isn't exactly weather because even the, the cold weather uh, phenomena are more intense. Um, and so I think what we'll see, that's why we did this program in Africa. In Africa, we have in this program, people who work in finance to finance startups in climate change. We have people who are scientists who actually do climate change. We have people who work in water uh, because water uh, scarcity is a byproduct of climate change and how we address that will be very, uh, very, very critical to how well we can overcome it. We have people who work in agriculture, which is facing its own set of challenges. All of these together actually give me great hope because we have these young people who are doing amazing things that weren't being done before and looking for new solutions using new technologies and new approaches, always multidisciplinary approaches uh, to try to drive innovation to fight this. So I think you will find, men, you're gonna find completely new industries that can arise from this if we plan carefully and plan intelligently that will uh, change our world for the better despite this monumental challenge. Yeah. I mean, as, uh, as, as you said, uh, climate change, ESG, sustainability as a whole is really uh, up uh, front and center now in, in all discussions, whether it is investment or governments or uh, uh, 
and climate change is uh, is a big subject. Uh, I think one of the uh, one of the criticisms people say of you know, the different governments in the world is that uh, we're really not preparing for the new climate. We uh, you know we we get all these storms uh, or fires, and then we help people stay at the same the same place. Yes. Uh, rather than have uh, a major plan of it. Uh, I think you're right, Mohammed. And whether, whether it's a big subject, there are big opportunities. So this, very much. this generation of young people, it's going to be up to you to figure out um, how we can turn this, turn what looks like a, uh, I mean, we have to head it off, yes. But also, how can you turn this big challenge and this big problem into an opportunity to make things better? George, here is uh, for a question from Angel Zag. And uh, the question is how I can rescue my passion from negative people and environment? Um, you know, one day at a time. And uh, I think you need to be very strong minded and tune out. Um, the negativity and toxicity because it is corrosive. It is corrosive to your spirit. It is corrosive uh, to your imagination. It does not advance your imagination. And it's a difficult thing to do. And everybody has to face it to some extent for another. That's not to say to not listen to thoughtful criticisms or feedback or thoughtful people telling you, uh, pointing out potential obstacles that you might not have identified. That's absolutely critical. That's part of planning, planning to try to foresee problems before they happen. So when they happen, you have a way to circumvent them and overcome them. But in terms of toxicity and how to, uh, all, everybody has faced that one time or another. And I think the best way to do it is I, I personally, I just try to shut it out. Um, I say, thank you very much. And I move on and uh, try to not leave room for it. Don't know if that's helpful, but it works for me. Right, right. Uh, George, uh, this question is from Karen, and she says, you mentioned innovation. Do you see much innovation in the education system? Oh, absolutely. We just had a, uh, we just had a conference, by coincidence, right before COVID hit last year in Cartagena, Colombia. We had a global conference, an Eisenhower Fellowships Conference, on the future of education. And we brought together 200, some 245 people from 37 countries. The president of Colombia, Ivan Duque, he flew down, flew up from Bogota to speak. The first lady spoke because she's involved in a lot of uh, philanthropic educational initiatives. We had a number of, we had Eisenhower fellows and really smart people, university presidents and uh, all kinds of, uh, real thought leaders in the world of education come and present and talk about things in higher education, in elementary uh, level education, in continuous adult education, uh, which is really important to the future of work, the future of the labor force. How do you continuously train people as technologies change? We had a, a spectacular three-day conference about this and the examples are everywhere. Um, one of the things we actually did that uh, was very moving, the Colombian singer Shakira, who many of you know, the superstar, she has a foundation called Pies Descalzos, Bare, Bare Feet, and it's to help impoverished children. She's founded a number of schools in Colombia for, uh, for young children to give them a head start from impoverished areas. There's one in Cartagena and we went to visit there and we had an event with the kids there. It was wonderful. Go on our website, www.ef, like Edward Frank, efworld, one word, dot org, and look up their uh, Cartagena, the future of education. And there's videos and a report from some of the uh, projects that our fellows also, uh, Eisenhower fellows from around the world presented some innovative projects in education that other fellows, uh, uh, they presented it to other fellows and got their input and there's, there's a lot going on in that world. My mother was a teacher, my, my late mother, my uh, sister is a teacher and I am, um, so this has been a, an issue close to my heart uh, all my life. And, um, and I'm very encouraged 
that um, amid all the all the issues we have in the world, uh, we're making progress there. Uh, so, George, this is uh, this question is about the Eisenhower Fellowship from Rehab Fire. And her question is, how would you differentiate the program from other global programs? For instance, the YGL, uh, I guess it's Yale Global Leaders. For us as Omanis, how would the program help us elevate our leadership skills and what type of projects done in the region previously? Well, I would say one of our, one of our real value added competitive advantages and we've studied a lot. There's a lot of wonderful programs on the one the rule for leadership, but we really emphasize the stickiness again of our global network for after you finish uh, the program. And we have amazing leaders all around the world. Uh, the former minister of planning and economic development in Indonesia, the vice two different former uh, vice ministers of education in China, uh, a woman in China who's a major general, the third highest ranking woman in the Chinese, in the Chinese military, uh, the former governor of the central bank in Thailand, and, and so forth, you know, the, the former head of the Saudi Arabian General Investment Authority, and so on and so on all over the world. That network and the opportunities that that provides for collaboration and, uh, and for joint projects of impact is I think something that, that really distinguishes us. Uh, there are other programs that have these, that have something that approaches that, but not in the way I would say humbly that we do. And also uh, some programs like Asosha, there's Ashoka for instance, there's a great program, there's social entrepreneurs. We have a broader band of disciplines. We have social entrepreneurs, but we have people from other fields as well. That's another advantage of ours. So George, I'm getting a lot of uh, questions about, about your life as a reporter. Uh, people asking about, and I'll uh, put them all together, to share stories about the most inspiring stories you lived, the most emotional, and people asking about the most stressful incident. So uh, do you have anything that you can share? You know, I'm not much for telling war stories, I'll tell you that. I, that's not really uh, something I've spent much time doing. Uh, covering armed conflict is incredibly difficult. I had many of my friends uh, were killed when, in covering the same conflicts I did. The rest of us all had a lot of close calls. Those are not sort of, um, those are the things that are, are part of the job, uh, actually. Uh, in terms of, uh, but intellectually fascinating, I, I was so blessed. I was able to, I met, I met kings and presidents and, and in a letter, in a message I sent our staff when I, uh, when I stepped away as managing editor of our newspaper, I had plenty of mopes and dopes, <laughs> you know, over the years. And uh, one thing that was a very fascinating chapter is um, both in, uh, I covered the White House for four years as the Tribune's chief White House correspondent, Reagan's second term. And then I went off to South America and then came back and I was diplomatic correspondent when James Baker was Secretary of State during the time of the first Gulf War. But before, the, before Iraq invaded Kuwait to, to start that off, uh, Secretary Baker uh, finished the negotiations that led to the reunification of Germany, which really historically was the end officially of World War II. And so between the beginning of the end of the Cold War of President Reagan and a few years later, uh, then the Berlin Wall fell. And then after that, still after the Berlin Wall fell, there were hundreds of thousands of Soviet troops in Eastern Europe. And how, those negotiations to see them go home without a shot being fired, that was fascinating to watch. It was literally being able to sit and see a first rough draft of history. But it began in, the, in President Reagan's second term, I covered... Another thing that was just fascinating at the time was the, the famous summit in Helsinki between Secretary General Gorbachev, the Soviet Union, and President Reagan, where they came close to almost agreeing to abolish nuclear weapons. Then his first visit, uh, the first visit of uh, President Reagan's to Moscow under the Soviet Union, um, 
and led to later, the, uh, he gave a famous speech at the Berlin Wall, Mr. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. I covered all that. I covered when Checkpoint Charlie was lowered in Berlin uh, to uh, eliminate the border between East and West Berlin. That whole period was just fascinating. And to see really responsible people on all sides uh, really try to find uh, understanding and common ground and turn a situation that could have been horrible into a positive for the world. Uh, you know, when I've come to Eisenhower Fellowships, I've often thought he would have approved of how that was done. So I was lucky enough as a young man to get to see that and see that happen. That was pretty, that was pretty thrilling. Fantastic, it is. So on your uh, last comment, there is a question about how do you uh, come to this time that we are living in and the, the tension that seems to be building between the US and China. How is a program like the Eisenhower Fellowship uh, can play a role positively in this? That's a, that's a very important question. So Eisenhower Fellowships, I mentioned before, Eisenhower Fellowships, first of all, has been operating in China since the late 1990s. We have had, over the years, we have sent, we have brought to the United States more than uh, 70 Eisenhower Fellows from China, and we have sent to China uh, close to 50 American Fellows. Uh, we, after I arrived, we, we, I mentioned we wanna grow the number of Americans who go overseas, expand that program so more American, you know, American leaders can know about the rest of the world. Well, we did it uh, initially by forging, negotiating a brand new program with China called the Eisenhower Jersing China program that sends 10 Americans every year to China for a four week fellowship. And we've been doing that since 2015. It's on hold because of COVID. We intend to resume it um, when um, physical conditions uh, permit. We also have a very robust group of uh, chapter of fellows in Taiwan uh, for many years. And our Taiwanese fellows have had a very interesting program, the Cross, uh, the Cross Straits program that they themselves, that we support from Philadelphia, but they themselves came up with to send, they've been, they did it for seven years in a row. Again, it's on hold because of COVID where they would bring, um, they would bring and send 50 young people, university age, again, our fellows are 32 to 45, they're mid-career professionals, but this was university age, uh, young people from Taiwan to the mainland, to China, and from China to Taiwan for three week exchanges every summer. Altogether, they've sent more than 350 kids both ways. They've even had some marriages <laughs> and weddings uh, along the way. And that is a program to build understanding in a really important flashpoint between um, China and in its relation with the United States, which is the status of Taiwan, which is very important to China for its own reasons and very important to the United States for its own reasons. So we have been working in China, I have said publicly um, and was quoted in Chinese media not too long ago. Uh, our board has discussed this in the recent meetings. We intend to continue our, our reason to exist is to create dialogue, um, direct dialogue to enhance understanding. That's really uh, best done among people who don't understand each other very well. And so in times like these, um, we're always taking the pulse and the temperature of this, of this relationship. And we hope the conditions allow us to continue to do this, but we plan to continue to do this. And again, I have no illusions that this will solve the US-China problem, but where I, like I said before, we will, we will put our little grain of sand to try to build something that hopefully can uh, overcome this current period of difficulties. Well, George, uh, thank you. I mean, we have uh, tons of questions, but we ran out of time. And I uh, really want to say thank you so much for this inspiring and fascinating session. As always, uh, good times passed so quickly, as you mentioned, and it was really enriching and enlightening hearing your journey and understanding the fellowship. And uh, I know I speak on behalf of all of our attendees when I say it was a great session. Uh, so thank you for being with us virtually. 
and look forward to hosting you in Oman uh, personally uh, soon. Uh, and thank you for all those who joined us today and for all the interesting questions. Uh, have a great evening all and look forward to our next uh, session. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you for your support and your constant encouragement and your always thoughtful guidance. Thank you, uh, everyone, for your thoughtful questions. And uh, it's really been my honor to be with you today. Brilliant. See you in October. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.